Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our next um, program for the October gathering. Uh, the distance between us, moving image speaks to uh, performance art. Uh, so just before we introduce our um, speakers for today, um, I guess we'll start a little about what um, myself, Clarissa Chikyamko, and uh, Cheng Jiayu, and um, what we were discussing, which kind of led us um, to think of this program. Um, so we've been working together on um, a bunch of uh, moving image projects, um, most recently an experimental animation of Southeast Asia program um, for Painting with Light um, last July. And we are uh, co-curating an exhibition which is to open um, April next year, which is looking at early video installation of Southeast Asia. So as part of like our moving image research, I guess this was also something that um, we've been thinking more deeply about, like with video installation, um, her, uh, in a discussion that we've had with our uh, museum director, Eugene Dan, I guess because we were, kept talking about video, 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 and he was just like, well, it's not only just about video, it's also actually about installation, mm -hmm. that history of installation, and um, expanding from that, we were thinking also, um, actually performance mm. is actually closely interconnected. Yes, and I think um, in terms of the intersections that emerge from moving image, because when we began to look at these early video installation works in Southeast Asia, a pattern began to emerge where the performing body actually was a kind of a central common denominator among a lot of these works that were pioneering the form uh, between the 1980s and 1990s. So today's conversation is really an extension of that research um, and the artists and film academics that um, will be foregrounding today have really been invested in these forms throughout the 70s, 80s and even to the present day as well. So we'll introduce the speakers um, that will be joining us today. Uh, first, we have David Hanan, who has researched Indonesian films since the 1980s and has provided English subtitle translations for more than a dozen classic Indonesian films, including Gotot Prakosa's Kantata Takwa. And in the earlier years, David Hanan actually pioneered the film studies program at the Monash University in Melbourne. And he is the author of two volumes on Indonesian cinema, titled Cultural Specificity in Indonesian Film, Diversity and Unity, and Moments in Indonesian Film History, Film and Popular Culture in a Developing Society. He was the editor of Film in Southeast Asia, Views from the Region, which was published in 2001 and will be published in a forthcoming second edition with a new slate of authors. Uh, following David's presentation, we'll have a presentation by the artist Ray Langenbach, who creates conceptual artworks and performances, convenes gatherings, writes on cultural theory, performance, and queer culture. He has presented work uh, throughout Asia Pacific, Europe, and the United States, and has curated exhibitions and performance events in Malaysia, Singapore, Palestine, the US, and Germany. Following that, um, we have Kaloy Olivides, who graduated from the University of the Philippines Diliman, fine arts um, major in painting. His works range from painting, performance, drawing, installation, collage, video, and sound. He is one of the recipients of the 2012 uh, 13 Artists Award by the Cultural Center of the Philippines. And his collage work entitled The Key was chosen as one of the Manila Art Award winners and received the Juror's Choice Award of Merit for the 2013 Philippine Art Awards. Uh, his video work, Here and Not Here, is part of the collection of the Philippine Modern Art Museum, the Ateneo Art Gallery. Um, his artist profile and some of his works are included in the CCP Encyclopedia of Philippine Art. Uh, in the music field, he plays for the bands Pastilian Dong, Rose, Kaguang, and Kapitan Kulam. Aside from being an art practitioner, he is also an art lecturer at the De La Salle College um, of St. Benilde since 2012. Uh, so we're going to begin our um, session by watching Gotok Prakosa's uh, Meta Ecology. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a very supple, 
yes. sumptuous film. A cinematic film um, that really looks at the kind of transdisciplinary collaborations between filmmakers and theatre practitioners in the late 1970s, which we feel um, is actually quite an early and groundbreaking moment. And David will also be sharing much more in depth about the context and the history of the film. Well, it's great to see the film on the big screen. Um, <clears throat> Now, I'd like to begin by um, saying that Gotthard Prokosa was a very good friend of mine from when I began research in Indonesia in late 1983 until his death in 2015. He uh, was a great contact person to have and uh, we supported each other in our work. So I'm very grateful now to uh, the National Gallery of Singapore and its staff, curatorial staff, for inviting me to be part of this important um, symposium. Uh, now, <clears throat> I'll get straight into it because um, I've got a lot of slides to show. I'm going to take it that a picture is worth a thousand words and I'm going to add a few words in and I hope you're not distracted by my words and by reading the text at the same time, but we'll try and get a balance there. Um, so, um, so here we begin with meta-ecology, and I want to begin, now this is a denda, uh, originally presented as a denda, uh, but staff here thought it was useful to begin with it, so we'll start with that paradox right now. Um, and I'm going to talk initially on the context of production, uh, the relevance of the film as a social allegory, uh, and body language in Indonesia before I get into discussing the film itself. Now, first of all, um, where did the seeds of the idea come from? Um, in 1978, Tegu Carriar began shooting his now famous film, November 1828, set during the Java War. It's also known as the Dipornogoro War. While playing in the film as a leader of a dance troupe who actually assassinate one of the um, Dutch leaders, Sardono lived alone for three months in an isolated hut in a field near Jogjakarta. And while there, he began to think about rice fields and earth and water and how um, rice farmers walk and move in the field and what kind of context that is. Just by the way, the figure on the right of the poster who's laughing, uh, uh, or mocking someone, that is Sardono in the, in the film, at a later point in the film, after he's been captured by the Dutch. Um, now, some of the information about the context of the making of the film I've got from a Tempo article from 1979, published uh, only five days after the completion of the four-day presentation of a uh, meta-ecology performance event, which was held in the grounds of Tamana Ismail Marzuki, which is the, certainly at that time the main cultural centre in Jakarta in the Jakini area. And it's an area which is backed by one of the tributaries of the Chiliwung River, the, the river that flows with its numerous tributaries through Jakarta. Now, the evolution of the project, um, and first of all, they set up in an area called Bekasi, to the southwest of Jakarta, still then rural, though probably not now. And while there, um, they began to experiment with how you might develop a performance event in the soil. Now, Sardono himself, who appears in the film dressed in white, he is a choreographer, a very famous dancer, 
a performance artist and a film actor and an academic. He's a multi-talented person. He's still alive. And so he had been running a, a, a collective of artists, just like Tegu Karia, who made the Indonesian Chinese director, who made the brilliant November 1828, also had a collective. So this idea of collective is very important in Indonesia. Um, and while they were in Bukasi, as and I'm quoting this, they learnt to love the soil. Um, now in September of the year, late September, 16 truckloads of earth were brought into central Jakarta to Taman Ismail Zazuki and laid out on um, the open air square in the, in, in the cultural centre, which is located next to the Jakarta Institute of the Arts, by the way. And they then for three weeks further experimented without drawing an audience, without attempting to draw an audience. They then performed this um, from the 12th to the 15th of October, 1979. Uh, it's also said that in 78, 1978, Sardono had worked and lived in central Kalimantan with Dayak people and that part of the experience of this, film, of, of this performance came from that as well. Now, there are some enigmas. Sardono has stated that meta-ecology demonstrates that art can be made anywhere. It could be made in mud. And that's very clearly illustrated in this film. He has also stated that meta-ecology um, was not really art. So, here we are. Art can be performed anywhere, but this is not art. Rather, it is a ceremony. So here we have the ceremonial moment towards the end, presumably related to cultural traditions. Um, now, the social context, Sawa, rice fields. Well, people living close to Malaysia would know that rice fields are very important. Um, I want to just show some slides from an episode in the 1990 anti-Saharo regime film Cantata Takwa, the Cantata, um, directed by Gotot Prokosa and Eros Jarrett, and it's based on, a, on the huge Cantata Takwa conference, sorry, uh, Cantata Takwa um, concert held in the huge Galora Bung Kano Stadium in Jakarta in 1990 with lead singers Iwan Fowles and Sawang Jobo, Jabo, well known in Indonesia, and poetry recitals by the, the great poet and dramatist and, uh, and um, W.S. Rendra. Uh, now, this scene in the film was directed by Gotov and conceived by Gotov. So it, obviously there's a relationship between this scene in the film and Metrocology 11 years earlier. Village kids in the Sawa sing Bento. Now Bento is a famous Indonesian pop song which is anti-business people who are exploiting poor people. It's a very famous song. Um, so you notice that the kids are by the river and they've been swimming in the river and uh, parts of the film show them swimming in the river as well. Now here you see the angry village kids singing bento. And this section culminates with angry village kids chasing the businessman bento. <coughs> so you could see a certain similarity between certain conceptions within uh, Metroecology and, and this well, Cantata Takwa. The Cantata of Devotion, I think, is the. the cantata, takwa can be translated in many ways, so broadly that's what they say. Now, I want to say more on body language in Indonesia as seen in um, 
four shots from the film Rora Mendel, which is a famous Indonesian legend. And I'm showing you four shots from an angle, reverse angle point of view shots at the time when the hero, Prono Chitro, sees for the first time Rora Mendel and begins to fall in love with her. Very conventional scene in some ways, but done in unconventional ways. Now, this is the first shot. Uh, it's a pertinent example of group body language because when the hero sees the girl for the first time, he's with two other people. And they also see her, but the, obviously the emphasis is on him. That's Ch Prono Chitro the, on the left. There's a reverse angle shot of Rora Mendut. And again, you have not one person in the shot, but two. And in this shot, Rora Mendot is behind her servant girl who's wearing the yellow and the green. Um, the third shot, reverse angle again. Again, there are three people in the shot. It's a, a group shot. The, the two guys on the, on the right, they are his servants. And you'll notice that the importance of touch in the image. There's body contact between the the three males, and there was also in the first shot in this sequence. And um, there is also bodily contact now in the fourth shot where you have um, Rora Mendel now standing ahead of her servant, but the servant clutching her shoulders. Now, I'll talk more about this in relationship to metaecology because, uh, as I say, I think one of the things that Metaecology does is to illustrate um, group body language in Indonesia. It's very much part of the film. Uh, I think this is a remarkable thing about, and a very creative thing about Indonesia. And you, if you stay there long enough and you keep your eyes open, you see all sorts of group movement that are very interesting. Now, the film Cantata Takwa is discussed in my recent book, which is actually here. Moments in Indonesian film history. There's a whole section on that. And um, there's a section on rural Mendut and also metrocology in my earlier book, which I will just highlight at the end of the whole presentation. Now, what I want to say is that this is a great film. I want to say that this is an important film. It's not just a, a curiosity. I see this film, and I've taught it for many years in this way, as a film of similar impact and historic significance to Bunuel and Dali's great surrealist film of 1929, Un Chien um, <clears throat> uh, uh, One of the things about Un Chien Andalou is it encapsulates a very important part of human experience. It's avowedly dream-based, you can, because it's dealing with, uh, with, with disguised sexuality, uh, and sexual situations, you can use Freud to analyse it. Uh, this scene that we, this famous shot there of the, the, the grand piano with the dead donkeys and the guy dragging himself towards the woman who's trying to escape him in the corner. That's obviously about repression and what all the repressive forces. So there's all sorts of things about the mechanisms of dream disguise as discussed by Freud. But I, the film was taken directly from dreams, so it's not as though they used Freud to invent situations. Now, the next thing is, um, this slide is not coming up as clearly as I'd like it due to the, uh, on the left-hand side, I don't know why that's there, um, but maybe it, it's the nature of the original photograph. On a small screen, it doesn't look quite like that. Another film of great impact is Maya Deren's 1943 Meshes of the Afternoon. Maya only made four or five films, most of them short, and uh, she's a key figure uh, also in terms of... She's regarded as the founder of the American avant-garde. With, with Darren, you've got also kind of deep psychology in some ways, but Jungian concepts are much more relevant than those of Freud. So instead of talking about sexual repression, one can talk about the body, the self, the self and the psyche, multiple selves, a mysterious mirroring alter ego, and archetypal symbols. So here you have a, a second 
short film which encapsulates something very important about 20th century discoveries within human experience. And again, coming from the artist, not from, the, from Jung, for example. Though she did read Jung later on and she certainly approved of uh, his writings. In metapsychology, it is not the psychic figures nor individual bodies, but multiple bodies. And here I come back to the earlier theme, which is this has to do with the... With, um, so I want to just say a few things about body language of the group in Indonesia. In Indonesia, I've argued in my first book, to varying degrees, the body language is different from what we find in many other countries. What we have is the spontaneous body, group body language of a touch culture. So it's not simply the body language of the individual nor of a trained military group, which is uh, sort of taught and, and, and doesn't ar arise spontaneously. Group body language, is this so strange? It's not often talked about. It's not so strange. After all, birds flying across the sky cluster or develop formations in ways that are photogenic and suggest an inbuilt, a spontaneous sense of group organisation and movement. Now, I just take just a few images. There are many more from the film that I could take. Here, they're obviously loving the soil. Um, <laughs> The film is full of humour, of course. <laughs> I'm not trying to, don't want to make it too serious. It's full of jokes all the time, even the way they fall backwards into the water. It's, um, so, another image of, of, of the group. This is later in the film. And I'll just quote something that is relevant to this. In a critique of Descartes, Emmanuel Levinas, has stated about humans, I, you know, not I think, therefore I am, the famous statement by Descartes, but I am bound to others before being tied to my body. And this is linked to the mother and maternity, things like that. Now, there have been other explorations of body language in Indonesia, and in particular, if you don't know about this book, you should look it up. It's a book called Balinese Character, a Photographic Analysis. It's hundreds of pages of plates, each with um, six plate or six images on each page and text on the other side. Um, uh, I won't say anything more about that because we're not here to talk about Bates and me, but that is a pioneering study of body language in uh, anywhere. Um, this is an early work in visual anthropology using photography and they were in Bali for two years in, I think, um, from the, sometime in 36 to 38. Now, what does Gotthard's film add to the performance? Well, for, uh, first of all, it's the capacity to shift point of view and proximity of a film it enhances the signifying potential, including its metaphoric aspects. Now, for example, this close-up of the guy on top of the greasy pole, you could say that his expression might be saying something like, I mean, this is just speculation, but on the other hand, what what, what do you feel when you see that face? He looks like somebody who's saying, who am I and what am I and where am I? Um, uh, second thing, a capacity for more, the, the film adds a capacity for more pertinent, sometimes humorous juxtapositions via montage. And the inclusion of an audience for the performance as part of the performance. In other words, in, 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 there were audiences for the film over those four days, sorry, for the performance event over the four days that it was staged intermittently. Um, but were they, were, was the audience part of the performance? Uh, let me continue. So there's the audience in the film. Uh, 
Who are these people? They're local neighbouring kids, most of whom would live along the Chile River and the experience of being surrounded by mud or subjected to flooding or being enmeshed in soil would be part of their daily lives. So the irony of this image is that while they're presenting this you know, avant-garde image of loving the soil, they're also <laughs> poking fun at the total environmental situation of Jakarta and its consequence for its poorer residents. Um, there is a brief moment in the film where the camera pans to the right and you can see there is a kind of, whether it's an academic audience or a literate audience or what, but they're all adults sitting on their chairs. It's just a very brief moment. Uh, this audience couldn't have been there for every performance. They've obviously decided at a certain point, maybe after they started performing and they found that local kids were coming in, that this was a part that they wanted to put into the film. I haven't discussed that with... Uh, didn't discuss that with Gorilla. Um, so that's something that the film adds, the whole relevance of uh, the performance. So here we see performance art speaking to an audience the audience comprises families, especially children from the local slum neighbourhood. Um, so I've already said this, Tim Borders, a tributary of the Chile River. Um, many of these children would live along it. The performance is not so much a drama, there is no story, but it is something to contemplate. It has been called a ceremony. We contemplate it, the children contemplate it. Um, it raises many issues. Now, I've almost finished this presentation, but I'll just a few more things. Time and space in the film. There is an intensification in the film of the sense of different time zones and zones of place in the performance. What is, and there's a question here, what is the impact of speeded up motion in the latter parts of the film and not earlier? What are the time, the zones of time and place in the film? Rice fields, contemporary Jakarta of 1979, metaphoric, yet also metaphoric reference to humans emerging from aquatic to semi-aquatic mammals, from fish, in other words, from aquatic to semi-aquatic mammals, which occurred 370 million years ago. I've been reading up on that over the last few days. Um, so what the speeded up movement of the film does is speeded up sense of humans in eons of time. And they're asking, this, the film is asking the same question as the guy on the top of the greasy pole. What are we and where do we come from? And we can still ask that question today. So here's an image of the, <laughs> the emergence from slime. But of course the irony here is that what's emerging from slime are not fish whose fins are turning into arms and legs, but humans emerging from slime. So we have a number, numerous dimensions to meta-ecology. It exemplifies the group body language of a touch culture in a way that uh, very few films manage to do so eloquently. It's an image of figures emerging from slime, at once a parable of human beings emerging in time and an allegory of life in poorer areas of Jakarta in 1979. So this is the first book, um, Cultural Specificity in Indonesian Film, and I discuss this film at some length in Chapter 5. I might say, by the way, uh, that Sardono wrote, liked this book and, and has written an appreciation of it, which the publishers use. And that with regard to Rora Mendel, the points I make about body language in the angle, reverse angle, romantic scene, I discussed that with the director, Ami Priono, who, like Suman Jaya, was 
studied film in Moscow. And I, I, I said to him about that scene, what I've said to you about that scene. And he said, this is wonderful. He said, that was quite deliberate. Every, everything that you say, all that was quite deliberate on my part. And you're the first person to actually come back to me and tell me about it. So there we are. Uh, the, that's the, uh, what the director said about it. It's not just my interpretation. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you so much, David. Um, Ray, I think um, if you'll continue with your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. That was great. Uh, and and um, <laughs> meta ecology uh, links really nicely with what I'm gonna mention, which is the event. And, and oops, sorry. Um, and how the event uh, functions in, in um, uh, video documentation, but first I just want to introduce a a, a um, economic uh, uh, context for what we're doing here. Um, okay, the the slides are they coming up? Ah, uh, here it is. Okay, good. Okay, um, so. I thought Marx is a good place to start. Imagine this manifesto as if it was written today. And it's about digital um, uh, representation. Uh, in, 19, in 1848, Karl Marx and, and Engels wrote, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production, and thereby the relations of production, and with them the whole relations of society. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois ep epoch uh, from earlier ones all fixed, fast, frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into the air. All that is holy is profaned, and man is uh, at, at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with its kind. Maybe that part hasn't applied so well. Um, the need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. Hence, my presence here and your presence here in the house of bourgeois aesthetic commodities discussing video documentation. So, um, uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, so I have 20 minutes, uh, <laughs> which I've used some of already, uh, and, 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 and I just want to put out some issues and some video images, and, and this is going to be a kind of indexical um, uh, uh, talk where I'm just pointing at things that you can follow down later if you wish to. Uh, so the moving image documentation can be defined as the transformation of gravity and entropy, space and time, into representation in the form of perceptions. And, and I thought that, that um, Sardono's um, uh, performance is perfect representation of ecstasy and death, you know, it, entropy, uh, the, the, the uh, tendency toward, of, of all uh, systems toward equilibrium, uh, you know, second law of, um, of um, uh, mm, yeah, second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so uh, entropy, uh, gravity and entropy into representation in the form of perceptions. Perceptions and their interpretation take place in the viewer's brain, not in the, uh, not on the screen. It's not a product of 
the author, we're talking about the death of the author, at, with, with film. Film brought this to the fore, this notion that, that the audience is the one that produces the uh, uh, event, and that's persistence of vision, which happens in the brain of the audience. So, the perception of movement takes place in the eye and brain of the beholder, not in the film or on the screen. Next slide, please. Okay, a human percept is now estimated, and, and, and we're talking about present day uh, uh, science, uh, 13 to 50 milliseconds parsed at a fixation or refresh rate of approximately three times per second. All visual med uh, mediation is built on top of this fundamental duration of eye and cerebral cortex parsing, which we might call cortical cortical montage, which underlies what we call montage in film or in, in video. A digital or all digital or analog works are secondary interpretations of subconscious cortical montage and interpretation. We're interpreting what we're seeing all the time. And that is the primary level of interpretation. Let me address this with a short video made in 2000 based on the data from the embodied mind by uh, Varela, Roche, and, and Thompson. The, the video now, now needs to be updated. I was just looking at it for the first time in a while. And, and uh, there are new studies which, which uh, cha have changed the mathematics of the video, the proportions of the video. The point of this work is that the performer is the audience-less media itself. The, the author, sorry, less media itself. In other words, it's the media that performs, which breaks the notion of artistic intention. Okay, here we go. Run it, thank you. There's sound. There is sound. Okay. It was just uh, <laughs> to me. It's important. Okay, that was it. Okay. If any of you didn't recognize the image, this this was shot by Jeremy Hia, um, and it was when. Um, at uh, Singapore Art Museum, SAM, the, uh, there was an ARX exhibition. And just before the exhibition, five minutes before the exhibition began, uh, Kwa Kian Chow um, uh, decided that uh, the uh, a cartoon of Lee Kuan Yew and Go Chok Tong, uh, which was a print, uh, should be removed from the exhibition, and it was torn off the wall and stuffed into a, a garbage bag. Uh, perhaps the only time in the history of museums that that, that has happened <laughs> to it in an art exhibition. And so it's all about time. It's just before the exhibition begins. And that is the image that um, I thought would be useful to be used to demonstrate then the temporality of, of the percept. but. 
But what that was was the beginning of an event, or that was an event. And that event in, in, uh, includes the PAP, Go Tok Chong, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Zin Se Wong from Hong Kong, uh, uh, Singapore Art Museum themselves, Sam ARX, everybody who was involved in those exhibitions, Jeremy Hia, uh, uh, the, uh, and the historians that came back, including this one, uh, to, to look at that event and the camera itself. The camera is part of the event. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what is a documentary film? As, so as Ziga Vertov understood in his dialogue over the, the significance of montage with Eisenstein, D.W. Griffith, and, and others, um, all film, not just documentary film, but all film is documentary film if you look at it through the eyes of meta-ecology or meta a meta-discursive look. In other words, when, when you are looking at a fictional film, a classic Hollywood continuity editing, you're in trance type film, that if you look at it as a documentary of itself, right, that you are looking at actors pretending to be, pretending to be other people. That, that's a documentary of the actors. The actors themselves are being documented, being actors. Yeah, you, you get it. Uh, so this was quickly forgotten by the capitalist film industry and the immersion of continuity uh, editing replaced uh, Vertov's uh, disjunctive notion of, of uh, kino propta, or film truth, and, and the trance of, uh, and trance replaced Brechtian alienation. All film and all video, including everything made in Hollywood, Bollywood, the laboratories of Pixar, et cetera, et cetera, are documentation events. All film records an event in which people or actors, the filmmaker and recording devices, uh, uh, the editor, the, the political context and social context and the environmental context, gravity and entropy, space and time, are intersecting agents or agencies in that event. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show you a couple more of my works, and, and, um, but just to give you a context of when I did them, I picked works from the um, uh, late 1980s and early uh, um, 90s, uh, and, and uh, people who were students uh, in, in the program uh, that I was, uh, uh, the sculpture program at, at USM, in uh, uh, University of Science Malaysia in Penang. Uh, Liu Kung Yu uh, was, was already an artist but wanted to learn conceptual art and so he joined us. Um, and, and this is one of his installations. Next, please. And then uh, Bahauddin was one of the students in the program. Um, and this is one of his installations, uh, video installation of the Kaaba and, and, uh, and, and we began to make robots because the, the, the female students uh, were being harassed by more religious uh, students to, uh, uh, not just the female students, but the males as well, that uh, they shouldn't be in a sculpture program, they shouldn't make idols. Uh, and, and so we began to make robots. In, in other words, things that did not look human, sculptures that did not look human, but acted like humans. And, and, and so they weren't really robots, they were automatons. They weren't, uh, uh, they didn't have any artificial intelligence. And this is this is uh, one of them uh, made by Baha, and and and, and I've uh, I've forgotten the names of some of the students, but this is a, a, a gentayu uh, a sculpture with flapping wings and uh, rubber wings, latex wings. Uh, another next one, next one, okay, and uh, other other automatons, okay. Next one, okay, and, and this is uh, one of the performances that I did during the, this period, and, and I'll talk about it afterwards. Okay, please run. This was just before the 1990 election in Malaysia. <clears throat> vote Hantu, vote Hantu, vote Hantu. Thank <laughs> you. 
Watanchu has been canceled. That performance is sensitive. Oh. 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 I'd like to explain to you why I have the opinion that it's appropriate for this performance to have been canceled. So we had different people doing Hantu postures uh, from the Jahut, uh, uh, based on Jahut's uh, sculptures. Uh, this is Mahatir uh, presenting a Sulu kingdom as Mahatir. It's based upon the distribution privileges. And the, I had uh, made a deal with the campus police to break up the performance, and, but the audience did not know that. And uh, Tan Sui Bang and, and the Gamelong Orchestra um, began, always began playing and then would stop. It would begin, we stop. Begin, we stop. So it was, in a sense, a representation also of uh, the election uh, cycle. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a, a, another installation. Sorry, I'm going through these very rapidly and just giving short snippets. This was a show curated by Wong Hoi Chong. Kolam of uh, the famous image of Mao smoking cigarette on the train. The video was in the center of the Kolam, sometimes reflecting the, the fan and other times showing the scenes. Okay, we can move to the next one. Sorry, I'm breaking this up. Okay, this was a, um, a called the Performative in Indoctrination Project, and it was a, a piece that I did in the U.S. first, uh, and, and sort of a tour around the U.S., and then I did it in Asia, I did it in Europe. Um, and it, uh, I would take uh, in the video which accompanied the performance, and that's why I'm showing it in five minutes, um, it, it um, uh, brings together, it, it's how performance and video intersected for me. So most of my performances have been with video, um, either as a, as a backdrop or as an overlay in, in some way, some interaction. Uh, so uh, this, and, and it's, this is about propaganda. And, and my study, my larger study for, for decades has been the study of American propaganda and, and then Singaporean propaganda when I lived here in Singapore, Malaysian propaganda when I lived in Malaysia, and the propaganda of different countries where I perform. And, and so I 
try to show the relationship in some cases between American propaganda and the local propaganda system in place. Okay, so we'll play this. This is an hour-long performance, uh, so I'm just showing a tiny sliver. <laughs> so. CIA, which Li Wang Choi and other Asian intelligentsia view as the apotheosis of the Enlightenment ideal of individual agency transposed to the state. You sound up a bit. The telos of Enlightenment freedom and the paradigm of the self-made. Oh dear. No. Yeah. Man, were conflated in a larger ideology of the self-determining state, with a manifest destiny to lead the world into the bright future of laissez-faire capitalism and democracy. Many people die for democracy, but America, America. Government always help, always do put money help this government. Why? Yeah. The weapon is where from? From the test of people. The weapons? Yeah. The weapons Gun. they use come from the US. Yeah. M16, something like that. Okay. <laughs> My son of the beach. This was at that. When indoctrination has been totalized in an information economy such as the United States, the prevailing myths of the society cohere with the information commodity spectacle that we present to ourselves and to other societies. Propaganda is completely matrixed into our day to day rituals and behaviors. Life itself became the eloquent propaganda tool that we presented to the world in the 1960s and still present today. The proscenium stage, the frame, the canvas, the heroic icons of the New York school and pop were no longer necessary when life itself could do just as well. Happenings and lifelike art marked the moment of the totalization of our ideological system. Totalized propaganda is the commodity spectacle of the body and the self as ideology. Our indoctrination system has reached a level of effectiveness that totalitarian regimes can never hope to attain. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. And now, last but not least, Kaloy. Good afternoon. I'm Kaloy Olavides, and I'll start my presentation with my work here and not here. Um, it's um, it's a performance slash video installation that it's uh, it's comprised of four television sets arranged in such a way as to form a cross, like one in front of me, one at the back, and one on both sides. And um, each TV ha has has um, a camera connected to it. The three TV monitors. One, two, and three at the back um, show live feedback. But uh, the one in front of me is a, is a pre-recorded of myself. Um, I, I recorded myself the day prior of the opening of the exhibition. And um, during the opening, i wearing the same clothes, wearing everything, standing on the same spot. Uh, I played the video. so. Yeah, during the openings, people can see themselves on the three monitors. But, um, yeah, and um, the one in front is, um, yeah, they can see themselves. They feel like vampires, you know, because it's pre-recorded. So there's a mode of the deception there. Uh, 
I did this again in, in 2006. It's the same concept, but um, just one monitor. Again, pre-recorded, wearing the same clothes on, and the following day, standing still for long hours. So the, my, my idea of, um, yeah, that's Li there's Lisa. Um, I'm playing. I'm playing with the definition of video as because um, when you see um, definitions of video on Google or in any dic dictionaries, it's defined as you know that there's this words moving images. So I'm playing with the idea of, about it, moving images, and um, I'm integrating my performance to not move at all. Same thing, uh, same with my performance here. I, I recorded directly on the phone. And um, when, you, um, when you look closely, it feels like it's just a photograph, but it's not, it's a video, me not moving. So uh, I'm playing with the idea as well of, about endurance, you know, human endurance. I mean, Where's my limit? What's my limit? Something like that. Um, also, I've noticed that, um, no. Yeah, I've noticed about video that video without a sound is still a video. Yes, but um, video without an image, right? I mean, like, would you still consider it a video? So in that particular work, I'm more focused on the sound from the um, um, videoing, um, taking a video of a white noise and then um, I manipulate the volume to make it look like, to make it sound like a um, seashore, something like that. So more, more on the sound and not on the image. Uh, I, I, I got the idea when I was document, documenting something, when I was documenting something and then I forgot to uh, uncover the lens. So we're like, okay, yeah, so like, a video without image is still a video, but a video without, oh no, a video without sound is still a video, but a video without sound. So what is it? It's more like a sound. Would you consider it sound or still a video? I don't know. But the mere fact for me is I use a video or a, vid, um, a camera, a video camera. I guess it's a video. Um, this one, I just have to play this first. It's a one minute and 20 second um, video. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I'm in a band and um, when we record a song, especially when not, um, we're not performing um, as a group, we play, uh, we record like individually, guitar first or bass first or drums first, whichever the sequence. We always have been, um, we're always guided with this click track, like, depending on the, how fast is your song. And so, um, in my mind, I'm, I have this click track. Then I record first. Yeah, I have to. So, um, I, 
the first layer of the video, the, uh, the inner, the inner, um, inner video. So there, I've been uh, having this click track in my mind, and then again repeat the same action with the same pace of my of the click track. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've been trying to be in sync with all my movement there, but um, yeah, it's it's not happening. It's never happening, and um, I'm glad that. It's not happening, and I don't want to do this again because, after all, we're humans. We don't want to be machines or robots. <laughs> so I don't want to do this again. Um, this one is personal um, endeavor because I, before, before doing this, I have this claustrophobia. Uh, it's, uh, this work is comprised of uh, alarm clocks, and then I, I am inside this um, this cartoon box, this corrugated box, and stay, I stayed there for yeah, that's the video. Oops. Anyway, uh, I am inside this corrugated box there, and um. There's a, certain, there's a certain point in time that um, the, uh, the clocks will alarm. You know, uh, it's um, pressuring me to, you know, endure more, uh, be in that coffin of a box until such time that um, I conquer my uh, claustrophobia. And it worked. It really works. Um, I, ha I don't have any claustrophobia, claustrophobia now. So, yeah. And we did it again a year later with, with, um, with Lisa. Yeah. Anyway, I can play the video. Let's move, let's move to the next work. This one is an eight video channel works work. Um, each each um, TV monitor is, uh, corresponds to a letter. So uh, the first one, and the, the leftmost is um, yeah, it's a sign language, you know, um, prompting the audience to go to the go, to go to the book. The book is. Um, I just have to cut this short. Anyway, I, I don't know how to do this. But um, yeah, each video uh, corresponds to a letter. This is the next, this is the next video. If you're a musician, if you look closely, uh, it, the, the chord I'm chord I'm playing there is A. And if you're a music major, you know, without looking at the video, you can you can tell that it's an A chord. I don't know, there's this special um, hearing of the music majors that they can detect what chord or what note is that. Anyway, it, it corresponds to a letter A and so on and so forth. So the whole video is a, is a word. You just have to um, look closely and decipher it, and it's, 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 it's stating you something. I'm going to move on to the next work. Yeah, okay, um, this one is... Um, Blurring, I don't know, it's my, it's, an, it's my attempt to blur the distinction between um, performance and sculpture. Um, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I am one of those cartoon people uh, wearing, this, uh, wearing the corrugated board. So I stayed there for the whole duration of the uh, exhibition. 
So it's an, uh, it's an attempt to, um, yeah, to blur the distinction between sculpture and, and, uh, and um, performance. And uh, there's a video projection of those uh, cartoon people, and it's an etching of a uh, one peso, one peso coin. So it's an attempt to, um, I don't know, maybe uh, like telling the people what's the value of our life, something like that. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I, want, I want to share some of my collage works because um, it has something, it's has somehow connected to my performance, performances, especially that's dealing with endurance. So just like this one here, it's like, a, a giant I've mentioned earlier, it's a commitment, you know? When, I, when, I, when I'm making my, my standing video, it's a commitment to finish it, to, uh, to, to stand for long hours. Same thing here, you know? It's a commitment to collect eyes, lots and lots of eyes from different sources of prints, print materials, magazines, to finish this one whole piece. Again, um, again, a collage work. Um, it's a hand collage going towards the center. The size of this is about four by four feet. Oh. And this one is uh, four by eight feet. So it's like, yeah, it's a commitment to finish an image. And it's uh, when I'm doing my video installations, like standing, Standing for long hours, yeah, it requires endurance, and it's different when you when you do different things, like you know you eat, and then afterwards you uh, you drink. But standing for long hours, just just doing that single um, um, action, it's, it's yeah, it's tearing your mind apart. Same thing here. It's it's my. It's a, it's a journey to finish this one image repeatedly until such time as it's going to be fill up the whole space. So that's how I connect it. And it's a collection of um, heads. Again, the same process. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, we'd like to thank all our speakers, uh, David, Ray, and Kaloy. Um, I think I'll just start by opening with a question for Kaloy, based on your <laughs> recent presentation. So, I mean, just um, uh, would you say then that, you know, your performance, video, sound, collage, like what links all of them is that idea of duration and um, in relation to that, would you consider actually your collage like a time-based medium in a sense? You know, maybe it might not seem so, you know, we might just classif classify it as collage if it were, you know, something that um, conservators would look at. But conceptually for you, is that actually a time-based medium for you because it captures, I guess, that duration of um, collecting, you know, a certain image? Yeah, I guess you could say that because um, most of the time I have this, um, you know, um, how to put this? I need, I need to finish this, something like that. This is the feeling of I need to finish this now. I'm bored with you. So I have to, uh, I have to finish it quickly. So I guess you could say that it's time. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> in that aspect because it's it's an endeavor. It's um, it, it requires you know to be again a commitment to finish it quickly because I want to move on to the next one. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, one of the things that I find uh, quite fascinating about your work, I mean, it's, in a sense, you are also recovering a kind of history of video and performance. 
because you're going back to some of the conceptual, when the video camera first came out, you know, and Nam Jun Paik and, um, you know, shot the, the trip he took uptown, downtown New York. Uh, and and, and the, the kinds of works that people were doing were experimenting with the frame, with the reproduction of the frame, that with, with uh, looking at oneself from different directions with the, with the camera and, ins and installations, and, and with duration in real time. You know, real time well, what was, was the call letter of the day, right? That you're working with real time, whereas film... Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 fictional film was all about the jump cut. So it was, yes, and, and so you're you're actually recovering some of this same kind of sensibility, or you know, of what is video, what is performance, you know, in in, in your duration works. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. And um, I, I make this um, when I'm doing my when when I think of performance, I have this conscious effort of not to go to, um, you know, performing arts. I don't know if there's a difference. You know, if, uh, I like what we, we have a chat earlier and um, you mentioned about if you're documenting um, demonstrations and rallies. And uh, I like, I, it's, it's raw. And I've, I've been trying to avoid the uh, uh, quote unquote choreography in um, doing my performance. So somehow I love it, the, the, the documentation of the demonstrations and the rallies because it, it's raw energy and it's not choreographed. So, yeah, that's how, that, that's how I remember it earlier. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kaloy. Um, you know, this idea of endurance and commitment to finish a project, for example, or to finish a, a kind of a duration that you have predetermined for yourself. I think, in a way, I wanted to pose this question to Ray as well, in the sense that you talk about anything filmic as a kind of a document that contains metadata in and of itself, right, of its actors and its agents. And when Clarissa and I were in Malaysia, you, you showed us a suitcase full of, of mini DVs and, um, you know, these in a way are, are your documents, you know, so I guess the, the broader question would be what drives you to, to create these documents and, and how do you see them now, you know, even two, three decades after they were initially made, you know, do the, do the documents retain their integrity of information or do they also change um, in terms of how you look back at them over time? Um, yeah, it, it, you're talking about the archive. Yes. Yeah, I have this archive. Oh, sorry. I have this archive um, of hundreds of of uh, document documents and documentations of performance art and demonstrations, riots, you know, ev events of large groups of people in the streets. I'm fascinated also by by that and how how um, the choreography, the unconscious choreography of of a demonstration, for example. Um, okay, and but but the archive itself. How does the archive function, and 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 is the archive itself an agency? You know, it becomes an agency. You know, when you gather all of these, these this, this kind of data together. You know, and, and one video. I mean, okay, so I, I showed one bit of a video, you know, in which I compress down to, to the essential function of a percept and the percept, and then you build up from the percept and the brain builds then into um, a document or archive. So, yeah, what, what happens when you bring all of those then back together as, as you know, in the same way that you do with your, your collage of the eyes, you know, it's the, the the, the amalgamation, how does the amalgamation and the massification then function, you know, that, that um, and, and how, do, how does that then change the nature of each of those elements of the archive? And I, so I see it as a sort of building up and building down, you know, uh, uh, type of thing. And um, uh, yeah, um, not sure what to, what to say other than that in answer to your question. I mean, there are lots of ways to go on, on, on that. But um, 
you know, I'm interested, as I said, in the event. You know, and, and, and what we do is, you know, in ecology, uh, people talk about the, uh, you know, the charism charismatic megafauna, you know, that people are interested in tigers and elephants and whales and the big things, right? But, but, the, but the, what ecologists are interested in is the worm, the, the moth, the, 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 the tiny things, which, you know, the, the lichen, which then builds the ecosystem that the tiger and the, the megafauna live off of or live as part of. And, and I think that that's what video is. Video is, you know, the, these gestures, you know, you know, the bodily gestures that David was talking about. All, that's what it begins to break down into. And, and I find that um, that's the, f the function of video rather than the, the, you know, what we always see, the artist's name, the artist performing. Uh, that centrality on the mega, the charismatic megafauna, rather than on the entire context of the event. Yeah, yeah I think on 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 the notion of you know the the kind of shared ecosystem that video actually has the potential to represent, um, then meta ecology as well becomes a very interesting example because it captures actually uh, a kind of relationship you know that forms between. Sadono Kusomo and Gotot Prakosa. And um, David, I suppose to wrap up, because we're a little bit short on time, would you be able to share about how uh, the relationship between Gotot and uh, Sadono Kusomo was formed and how the film itself you know, is able to then reflect that quality of, of collaboration and dialogue? Thanks. Uh, just as Sardono says, some um, uh, f the film shows how art can take place almost anywhere, but that it's not art. Uh, I'm going to give you an answer to your question, which is not an answer. Right, that's a very, very difficult question. Uh, I don't know how they came together, um, but the whole spirit of the Jakarta Institute of the Arts when I first went there, which was in 1981, when I went there on, uh, to obtain Indonesian films for Australian students, uh, tremendous atmosphere of mutual interest and mutual support. There's a word in Indonesia, which is probably well known even in Singapore, Gotong Royong. That means mutual support. And it was a very mutually supportive community and it had elders there. Jaya Kasuma, the director of Tiger from Champa and other films, together with Usma Ismail, who by then was, had been dead for 15 years or more. He was there and he was like a benevolent presence. Um, Charlie Arifin, um, a set designer, got out. Uh, Frankie Rudden, who's still a very famous musician, uh, doing work all around the world. All of these people were there and very open and wanting to meet other. So, I, I mean, I was taken into that community. I would think that at a certain stage, got out was taken into that community as well, right? And they appreciated his talent. And of course, Sardono himself had his own collective quite independently of the Jakarta Institute of the Arts. So I didn't meet him until later on. So that's the, that's the only way I can talk about how that occurred. It's probably, I would see it as cultural, the way in which a particular culture facilitated relaxed communication between significant artists. Um, and uh, how this impacts on the film Again, I, I think I've given an account of what the film comes to mean. There's some kind of intuition about what could be done with the performance that Gotthard has had. But I don't know. I mean, Gotthard brings out things by the ang angle of his camera, um, which somebody watching in the crowd may not notice. I must say, 
I've seen greasy pole competitions where people compete to climb the greasy pole in Jakarta. And um, uh, I haven't seen it done quite like this before because the camera position brings out questions and the lighting as well. So um, I think it's just a, a gentle creative intuition which was part of Gotthard's nature. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I think that's all in terms of the questions that we have as moderators, but if any of you have any other questions, please feel free to ask our speakers after the session's concluded. And thank you again to David, Ray, and Kaloy for being our informal community of speakers today. And thank you everyone also for attending the session. Um, we have another session at 3 p.m., the Two Planets session, chaired by Adele, so please do join us if you have time. Thank you, thank you.